Hi, my name is Tim Garoni. I work in the School of Mathematics at Monash University. And in this brief video, I'm going to take you on a random walk through mathematics. Let's begin with a very incomplete timeline of the history of mathematics. We just illustrate here a few of the key milestones. Geometry, algebra, calculus, set theory, all of these branches of maths are very precise and deal with very precise objects, shapes, equations, etc. But when did people first try to understand randomness mathematically, to quantify chance? What does it even mean to quantify chance? How can maths, which is so precise and pristine, hope to explain something messy like chance or randomness or uncertainty? Well, the answer is via probability theory, which was founded around the same time as calculus. But unlike calculus, which was motivated by lofty pursuits such as physics, the study of probability was originally motivated by gambling. Now, gambling on dice, etc., dates back to prehistory. But the mathematics of gambling dates only to the Renaissance. A turning point occurred in 1654, when a well-known gambler, who liked to associate with Europe's intellectuals, posed several questions to the famous mathematician Blaise Pascal. Pascal then exchanged a series of letters with another famous mathematician, Fermat. And in this exchange, the pair solved several specific problems related to gambling. But more importantly, they introduced the basic ideas of probability theory. Here's an example of an actual problem discussed by Fermat and Pascal in their letters. Should you bet even money on rolling double sixes at least once in 24 rolls of two dice? Even money here means that if you bet $1, and you win, you get $2 back. To answer this problem is now high school mathematics. But prior to Fermat and Pascal, there was no mathematical framework with which to think about such problems. We now think about it as follows. Consider all the ways to possibly roll a double six in 24 attempts. You could roll it on the first attempt. That happens with probability 1 on 6 times 1 on 6, which is 1 on 36. Or you could roll something else on the first attempt, which happens with probability 1 minus 1 on 36, and then roll double sixes on your second attempt. Or you could roll something else on the first two attempts, and then roll double sixes on the third, etc., etc., etc. Or roll something else on the first 23 attempts, but then get very lucky on your last attempt. If you simplify this, we find that the probability of success is less than a half. And so betting even money is a bad idea in this case. The development of probability theory involved contributions from many very prominent mathematicians. And here's a, a few key milestones. The law of large numbers is a precise mathematical statement of the fact that if you flip a large number of coins, about half will be heads. The law of large numbers states that if you flip infinitely many coins, exactly half will be heads. Bayes linked statistics with probability theory. It was a milestone in statistics and also in probability theory and played a crucial role in the computational statistics revolution in the late 20th century. The central limit theorem explains the ubiquity of the bell curve in data analysis. And the past 90 odd years of probability theory is all based on something called Kolmogorov's axioms, a set of rules for doing probability theory. This axiomatic theory gives a completely rigorous and precise theory to describe randomness, all based on abstract set theory. 
and it places probability on the same firm foundations as, as other branches of modern mathematics, such as algebra and geometry. And here's a quote from the prefix to Kolmogorov's book. The author set himself the task of putting in their natural place among the general notions of modern mathematics, the basic concepts of probability theory, concepts which until recently were considered to be quite peculiar. We'll now go through some examples of fundamental ways in which probability theory appears in 20th and 21st century mathematics and science. We begin with a fundamental branch of mathematical physics called statistical mechanics which aims to explain macroscopic properties of matter from the interactions of the microscopic constituents. They consider a large number of particles, for example, the H2O molecules in a jug of pure water. The key observation is that many microscopic states correspond to a given macroscopic state. Statistical mechanics explains macrostates by averaging over all consistent microstates, so all arrangements of the molecules with the same macroscopic properties. Now, macrostate here refers to properties such as temperature and volume, the properties a person would normally use to describe the jug of water, while microstates correspond to the precise arrangements of the molecules. Let's think about temperature for a moment. What does it actually mean? It somehow quantifies if something is hot or cold. But each H2O molecule in a jug of water is identical. There are no hot molecules or cold molecules. Temperature is not a property of one molecule. It is a property of a large number of molecules and how they interact. And statistical mechanics gives a precise definition of macroscopic properties like temperature using probability theory. Statistical mechanics was the first fundamental application of probability theory to theoretical physics. The use of probability theory in theoretical physics was initially quite controversial. <clears throat> it was in seemingly stark contrast to the determinism of Newtonian mechanics. But statistical mechanics has proved to be a spectacularly successful theory. In particular, it has been very successful at explaining phase transitions. As an example of a phase transition, consider the abrupt change from water to ice at zero degrees. Now we're all familiar with this, but why does it happen? Whether the jug is at minus one degree or plus one degree, it still contains the same collection of H2O molecules. How do these molecules know to collaboratively behave like a solid in one case, but like a liquid in the other? Statistical mechanics attempts to answer such questions using probability theory. This study of phase transitions is a very active branch of 21st century mathematical research. Now, there's no Nobel Prize in maths. Instead, we have the Fields Medal, which is awarded every four years. Multiple Fields Medals have been awarded this millennium for work in statistical mechanics, in particular on phase transitions. Another fundamental physical theory in which probability plays an essential role is quantum mechanics. Let's consider a single electron. The state of an electron is given by a wave function, which depends on space and time. The wave function evolves deterministically according to an equation discovered by Erwin Schrodinger in 1926. Now Schrodinger knew that his wave function described the electron somehow, but he didn't know exactly how. It was Max Born that realized the answer required probability theory in a very fundamental way. If you measure the position of the electron at time t, then the probability of observing it in some region of space, which we can call R, 
is equal to the integral of the square of the wave function over r. There's nothing particularly special about electrons here. In fact, measurements of all physical observables have a similar probabilistic interpretation in quantum mechanics. Now, Born, quite deservedly, won a Nobel Prize in physics for this work. And if there's any parents watching, an amusing side note is that Born's other claim to fame was being the grandfather of Olivia Newton-John. Regardless, we conclude that quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics show that probability theory plays a very fundamental role in explaining our universe. To misquote Einstein, the universe really does play dice. Now let's turn from fundamental science to a very recent practical application of probability theory. You've probably heard the terms data science and machine learning used in the media, but what do they mean? Just as there's no universally accepted definition of what constitutes mathematics, the terms data science and machine learning are a little bit ambiguous, but it's fair to say that they both center on statistics and computation. So what's statistics to start with? Well, statistics uses probability theory to make inferences from data, to learn things from data. Then what's data science? Roughly speaking, it is applied computational statistics combined with tools from computer science for handling data. And what's machine learning? Machine learning centers on designing algorithms to automatically infer useful information from data. So it's very similar to statistics, but with an emphasis very much on algorithms. Machine learning has had some amazing successes. For example, Google's AlphaGo artificial intelligence system beat the world's Go champion four matches to one, causing the champion to retire. And for those of you who haven't come across Go before, it's a board game even more complex than chess. So this was a remarkable achievement. Despite this success though, the mathematical foundations of machine learning are really quite murky. From the perspective of mathematics, this is not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing. It's a wonderful opportunity. It provides an important and very interesting challenge for the next generation of mathematicians to put machine learning on a firm mathematical footing. And this is not a purely academic exercise. Future progress in machine learning will rely on developing a deep understanding of why particular machine learning algorithms work well when they do work well, and why they don't work well when they don't work well. Just as several recent Fields Medals have been awarded for probability theory in areas such as statistical mechanics, it seems likely that Fields Medals in the coming generation will be awarded for breakthroughs in the foundations of machine learning. In fact, there are deep connections between the foundations of machine learning and statistical mechanics, but that's a topic for another time. Of course, in addition to the pure mathematical motivations, there are lots of very interesting and very well-paid machine learning jobs in industry. Have a look at the AMSI Math Ads Career Guide for examples of the plethora of diverse industries hiring maths graduates to do machine learning and data science. Okay, let's change tack for a moment and return to a question related to gambling. How many times do you need to shuffle a new deck of cards to get a random ordering? Now by shuffle here, I mean the usual riffle shuffle, where you cut the deck in two and then interleave the two halves back together. This question could have been posed by Pascal and Fermat, but it was only answered in 1990 by Dave Bayer and Percy Diaconis using some sophisticated and quite beautiful modern mathematics. So let's consider the question more carefully. 
There are 52 factorial possible orderings of a deck of cards. That's roughly eight followed by 67 zeros. We want to select a random ordering with all orderings occurring with equal probability. So each ordering is equally likely to occur. Now, after one shuffle, some orderings are much more likely than others. And in fact, some are impossible. After infinitely many shuffles, all orderings occur with exactly probability one on 52 factorial. We call this a uniform probability distribution. We want to know how close to uniform the probability distribution of card orderings is after some finite number of shuffles. It's not really obvious what close means here. We need some notion of distance between probability distributions. And modern probability theory gives us that. Here's a picture of what Bayer and Diaconis found. The horizontal axis gives the number of shuffles, while the vertical axis shows how close the probability distribution on card order it is to being uniform. A value close to one on the vertical axis shows the distribution is far from uniform, while a value close to zero shows it's very close to uniform. So after four or five shuffles, the deck is still very far from random. At least seven or eight are needed. Now, prior to Bayer and Diaconis's work, many casinos typically only shuffle the deck four times. And so players skilled at card counting could do very well. Unfortunately, these days, casinos have become a lot better at randomizing their decks. In related work earlier this year, Monash Honors student Zifeng Guo study the analogous problem for the two by two by two Rubik's cube or the pocket cube. And the question there is how many random turns need to be applied to the Rubik's cube to scramble it? Now, even though only 11 moves are required to solve it, it turns out that more than 20 random moves are needed to ensure each possible configuration occurs with roughly the same probability. So in some sense, scrambling a Rubik's cube is even harder than solving it. Mathematically speaking, shuffling is what we call a random walk on the group of permutations of the card orderings. And very similar ideas underlie what we call Monte Carlo algorithms. These algorithms are named after the famous casino in Monte Carlo because they're inherently based on randomness. They approximately solve hard mathematical problems using multiple random guesses. The number of shuffles required to mix a deck of cards is directly analogous to determining how many iterations a Monte Carlo algorithm needs in order to produce an accurate approximation. Monte Carlo algorithms are one of the most powerful and commonly used computational methods used in a wide variety of applications, including science, engineering, and economics. And perhaps surprisingly, ideas used to study card shuffling can also be applied to study Monte Carlo algorithms. One common method for quantifying the efficiency of Monte Carlo methods is to study how the choice of the initial guess affects the end result. The same ideas also produce a cute card trick. Here's how it works. The magician asks the victim to thoroughly shuffle the deck and then slowly and carefully deal out the cards face up. So here's an example here starting in the top left, ending in the bottom right. The victim is then given the following instructions. Pick a number from one to 10 and count forward that number of cards. So let's say we, we pick four as the victim. So we count four cards ahead. One, two, three, four. 
then look at the card that you land on and count forward that number. Now we landed on a queen, so what does that mean? Let's take face cards as being worth five. So we count forward five. One, two, three, four, five. We landed on a two, count forward two. One, two. Landed on a six, count forward six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Landed on a nine, count forward nine. Landed on another six, count forward six. Landed on an eight, count forward eight. Count forward five. Landed on a king, so count forward five. We landed on an ace, count forward one. And now we've landed on a three, but there are no more cards left. There's not enough cards left for it to count three spaces ahead. So three is our final card. And we're asked to remember the final card that we land on. The magician's task is to guess the final card that the victim lands on. Now the beautiful mathematical fact is that if the magician starts the same counting process as the victim, then with high probability, they will end on the same card as the victim, regardless of which card they choose to start on. For example, suppose the magician chooses, instead of four as their initial guess, they just choose one. They'll land on this five, they'll count forward five, they'll land on a queen, they count forward five, and they again land on this six of diamonds exactly the same as the victim did. And from that point on, they're using the same counting procedure, so they end up at the same final card. What if they started on the second card? They'd, they'd end up on the original queen that the victim landed on, and from then on, the rest of the trajectory would be the same, and the final card would be the same. And similarly, if they pick the third card, or the fifth card, or the sixth card, if they pick the seventh card, the first two rows are now a little bit different, but the final two rows are the same. And again, they end up on the three of spades as their final card. The only time that something goes amiss is if the magician in this example happened to pick the 10th card to start on. And then they would not end up on the three of spades as their final card, they'd end up on the 10th of diamonds. So the trick is not guaranteed to work. But the probability of success is roughly 85%. And when it does work, it really seems like magic because there's no sleight of hand whatsoever. And this insensitivity to the initial guess is closely related to an important method of studying the efficiency of real world Monte Carlo algorithms. Well, I'm afraid our random walk has now come to an end. I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour through the mathematics of randomness. And I look forward to seeing you on campus sometime soon. All the best.